This is AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. I'm Tony Schiavone, along with Referee of the Year, Aubrey Edwards. Why did you say it like that? Aubrey I don't Edwards. know, because you always put me over like I'm like the greatest fucking thing ever. And I'm just like, no. Well, I, backstage, you're always walking around like I'm the greatest fucking thing ever, so I might as yeah. well. I mean, I do, and I say that. <laughs> I'm like, I got the biggest cock of anybody in this fucking company. So I'm walking around, just like throwing it over my shoulder. It's confidence, and, Tony. It's confidence. And I also discovered if I can go behind the scenes here a little bit, which I will, if oh, I can't, we'll edit it out. But uh, you, uh, you smoke cigars are the best of them. I do. I gave up drinking and I needed something else. And uh, it's easier to stick to one cigar than it is to uh, stick to one drink. Yeah, but you know what you're doing. Cigar, you know, you, you have to know what you're doing being a cigar smoker. You yeah, do know I mean, doing. I've had enough friends who had babies and got married, so I've had some practice. <laughs> we don't need to edit this out. We can totally Where are we this going out. here? We welcome I to... I have no uh, idea. <laughs> we welcome to the podcast, Wardlow. How's it going? Oh, man. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. You're such a laid back guy, man. So you laid know, back. Just, yeah, just, just absolutely laid back. We appreciate you being with us. Uh, one of the newest members of the inner circle. Oh, that's uh, right. Uh, oh. along, of course, uh, along with MJF, Mr. Mayhem as yes, well. Uh, here's the here's the list we have of your accolades, and I know they are going to grow as time goes on. Oh, absolutely. We've got international the, uh, wrestling cartel super indie champion, three times international wrestling cartel world heavyweight champion. Damn right. And revenge pro world champion. Yes, sir. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> Incredible, incredible accolades so far. Definitely, as Tony said, that list is only get get longer. So, inner circle with Chris Jericho. How surprised were you after Full Gear when that happened? I guess, like, I mean, this is unrestricted, so like, you knew it was going to happen. I mean, <laughs> how surprised were you when you found with out? Max, I'm not too surprised. I that's, mean, that's true. I guess what we do is win. So, hey, I expected us to win, and I wasn't sure if we would be rejoiced with open arms no <laughs> um, maybe you but not him <laughs> yeah so i guess i was a little more surprised that jericho welcomed us um with smiles and hugs and all that definitely a uh, big surprise i don't think anybody was really expecting that uh during full gear no they weren't but you know realistically wardlow and uh, same for you aubrey if you take a look now at what we have we have so many different potential storylines oh, with him so now, many. a member of the inner circle, and, and so Wardlow many. a part of it, and and Wardlow and Jake Hager staring at each other. Just uh, a lot of good stuff that can come out of that. So, I was surprised at first, but then when I think about it, I'm not surprised. So, no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, I want to talk about your uh, your your in ring debut. There's a lot of there's a lot of debuts you made here. Uh, we had video of you, of course, a video package about Wardlow is coming and. And you arrive, but I want to go back to, I think, what has been your defining moment here? I think everybody would agree it's the cage match against Cody. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, that just, uh, I remember backstage, everybody going, boy, the kid, <laughs> he really performed well. And uh, were you were you nervous going into that match? I mean, that's, that's a big, high-profile match on a big show in a big arena. It was a very unique experience. Yeah. Um, it's weird. It's like that whole evening and match is like a blackout. Mm -hmm. Really? It's like, it's hard to even recall. Um, I don't remember the entrance. I, the only, <laughs> the only thing I like really remember is when I was standing in the ring and Cody and I were squaring off when the bell rang. That's like the only thing I can vividly remember. But, um, I said it in the, the road to recently that that is, you couldn't have put any more pressure on me. Oh, no. No, you're right. It's like, don't fuck up, dude. <laughs> I mean, my first match ever on live TV. Gets the face of the company in his hometown. In his hometown. In, in a cage. first ever cage match. Main event. Cody Rhodes. Like, mm -hmm. But um, I will say I most definitely have felt for a long time that I was ready for that. And... I was comfortable being in that position and I knew I could perform under pressure and I perform better under pressure. But, um, man, most definitely the best night of my life. 
So it was really great because I remember specifically, like, I didn't know you too well at that point. I just assumed you were kind of one of these, like, standoffish big dudes, whatever. But, like, turns out you're a fucking sweetheart. Um, and I'm like, oh, did you, did you bring anybody for this show? Figuring you brought, like, some, like, super hot chick. And you're like, I brought my mom. And I was just like, this guy's the best. He brings his mom to his debut. Like, how about that? Yeah, well. What does she think? As much of a dream, it is mine. It's as much hers. That's true. You know, she wanted this as much as I did. She wanted this for me as much as I did. Um, But yeah, I saw a lot of happy tears flowing that day, which is always a good thing. What did she think about you catching someone as they're moonsaulting off the top of a cage? Um, she probably had a slight heart attack, <laughs> as did I, as did I, I've never, ex- you know, there's no words you could explain watching somebody come 15, 20 feet down. It's a wild experience. Well, it was a memorable night for many reasons. I know your mother was proud. I think everybody backstage was proud of, of how you performed. And, you know, you mentioned that you, you knew you were ready for that moment. You prepared for that moment. The, the, the confidence that you uh, that you were showing that night, and it, as you've always shown, but especially big uh, uh, that night, it, it's something, you know, we've talked to a lot of wrestlers here and a lot of performers. That confidence is something that I don't, I don't know if you can learn. I think you have it. Am I right? I think so. I mean, I felt, gosh, I felt I was ready for TV when I was on my trampoline as a teenager. Ah, you know, <laughs> there you this go. Is, it's just something you know deep down. Right. All right. So uh, your debut on Dynamite uh, was uh, in November of last year. Yikes. Yeah, we're oh, coming up. The one year anniversary. The 13th yeah. will be one year. Oh, damn. Yeah. That's crazy. So when did you know you were coming aboard as uh, the enforcer, so to speak, of MJF? When did, when did that all laid out get laid out to you? Um. August 31st, All Out, mm. when my first video played. Okay. Um, after the video aired, there was a conversation about the idea of myself and Max. And um, essentially, Max approached me and said, hey, I'm about to make a lot of enemies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> I need somebody um, to have my back. And we came in agreement. It's so. pretty good. So obviously, if you're the enforcer for Max, you have to wear a lot of suits. I think it popped me real hard when you came in with your little Burberry tie. Fantastic. How many suits do you actually have? I've lost count. At this point. <laughs> wow. We need to get like a men's warehouse sponsorship with the amount of people yeah, that wear suits at this company. Oh, man, we got to get Dana on that. That's actually not a bad idea. Yeah, let's hook it up. Yeah, get somebody dressed. It's been great chemistry between you and MJF, though, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously something there. There's sure. also a little bit of friction, but sure, just, and, just and that's what makes it great. Yeah, right? yeah, great chemistry with him and I, and I think it's only going to get better. So you ended up uh, having a match in Chicago uh, with DDP, or maybe it was Miami, one of the two. I wasn't in the match. Yeah, but I know you were on the outside. I was there. So that, that calling that thing was insane because it's like a six man tag and it's already wild. Like, what was that experience like working? Well, the fact that it was Bash at the Beach. Yeah. Was like, I couldn't believe it. That was such a cool venue growing up and show growing up. So I was very excited just for the Bash at the Beach aspect, but for DDP to be involved you know, a legend. It was, um, among other things I've experienced, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. Some of the people I've been able to meet and gain knowledge from and work with and just having these experiences that, you know, teenage me or young me would have never even trampoline Wardlow. Yeah. We're talking with Wardlow here on AEW unrestricted. And uh, I want, I want to go back. You touched on it, and we jump around a lot here, so bear with us. Uh, I want to go back to the cage match. I, I uh, sometimes, as an announcer, know when things are going to happen, and I don't. I had no idea the moonsault off the cage was going to happen. Uh, How could just, you not? You see that cage, you know someone's going to jump off of it. 
No, I no, you don't. <laughs> you just don't. I just assumed it was like, oh, there's well, no. a cage. It's not going to be Wardlow. Cody's probably going to jump off of it. I've watched no. wrestling. Even when he looked up <laughs> top, I'm thinking, what the hell is he doing? Is he trying to escape? And then he gets up and he stay. Really, I, I didn't know what was going on. So anyway, th- th- that's not the story here. The story here is that when you were approached about that, what did you think about when they said uh, Cody's coming off the cage? Uh, what was going through your mind? I said, let's do it. In the backstage area. Oh, before, right before the match? Yes, before the match. Oh, well, right before the match, getting ready to go out was probably the most unique feeling I've ever felt. Mm. Um, once again, it was like this blackout of just sure. so many people were talking in my ear. But I wasn't right. wasn't registering what they were saying. You're just focused. Yeah. I've never been so uh, focused in my life and just tunnel vision. Um, but when I initially heard about it, I was stoked. I was right. like, "Let's do it." There's there's never been anything move wise that I've ever said no to in wrestling. Mm. Um, there's a couple things that have happened that I won't do again. <laughs> but. but um, I'll try everything once. Speaking of different moves, um, you were in the world title eliminator tournament. And I know first round you were with Jungle Boy. Mm -hmm. And he's got a very different move set than Mm -hmm. you. Very high flying, very quick, very agile. And you're just big man, beat the shit out of people. What was it like planning a match with someone who has a very different style than your own? I, I enjoy it almost as much as big men match mm. um, I've always enjoyed the storytelling of big guy little guy David Goliath and I feel like um, smaller wrestlers and larger wrestlers can really complement each other um, the larger wrestler can base and make the little guy it can help the little guy do anything um, and then the big guy can pick up the little guy and basically do whatever you want to him so I feel like there's we can complement each other and really bring the best out of each other in that aspect. Then you move on to a uh, hangman, Adam page in the, in the second round and a kid who can, do, can literally seemingly do anything. So talk about that match for us. Now that's my favorite style of match. Yeah, that one was good. Um, the bigger and harder you hit, the better, um, you know, wrestling for me, you know, it, 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 this is what I do. This is what I know. This is very real to me. You know, when I go out there, I'm competing. I'm an athlete. I'm a wrestler. Um, I'm not an entertainer. I'm not an artist. You know, when I'm out there, am I entertaining? Absolutely. Do I create art? Art of war, sure. Sure. Um, I'll create a painting with their blood. Yeah, there you go. But um, I, could. I like hard-hitting wrestling, beat the shit out of each other, and... That's what I had with Adam. Yeah, that was one of those matches where I'm like, are they are they actually like shoot hitting each other? Like, because you guys were like actually like almost beating the shit out of each other. Yeah, we we didn't pull any punches. No, it was, and I think that's kind of one of those moments where it's a big tournament. It's leading to a potential pay per view spot. Like, you have to give it your all, and I think because of that, it's a very memorable match. Just not not just for you and for Hangman, but I think just for dynamite in general like it's one of those that i feel like people are going to go back to and say oh no this one this one was good that yeah. whole tournament was filled with great shit yeah that was um cage match aside i think that's my favorite match so far was me and Paige. okay i'm gonna read this question before we go to a break <laughs> i didn't write it but i think it's pretty cool uh on aw dynamite on more than one occasion we've had more female viewers than men in the 18 to 34 demo could that possibly be attributed to your on-screen time? Okay, so it's funny you say that because <laughs> before I even started, like a little personal goal of mine that I hadn't expressed to anyone okay. was that I wanted to get female viewership. Yeah, buddy. So the fact that we're having this conversation um, yeah. is very cool. And maybe it is me, maybe it's not. But I would like to think I am helping that demographic And Mm -hmm. I would like to think that those numbers will continue to rise. We've got a true ally in Wardlow. 
We'll start calling you the female demo god. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. T-shirt next week. T-shirt. Oh, guaranteed. Shop AEW.com. It'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. We're talking to Mr. Mayhem Wardlow. We're going to talk about his background before he got into pro wrestling. One thing I'd like to talk about is State Farm Insurance. And I say I'd like to talk about that because I've been a State Farm customer, a member, if you will, since 1981, since the year that I was married. State Farm has surprisingly great rates on both auto and homeowners. Tony, you've been a member of State Farm since before I was born. There you go. That means that they must have like great customer service. They've got yes, they agents do. available everywhere. Like to be a member of a company for that long, you have to be really, really happy with their policies. I'm happy with their policies. And now I'm happier, Aubrey, with their easy to use technology because back then, You'd have to have the insurance card in your wallet. It was a paper insurance card or like a cardboard insurance card. Now you have it on your phone. You have, they have a great app and you have your insurance card right on your smartphone. So the technology that is advanced in the world has also advanced insurance in insurance thanks to our people at State Farm. So you can manage your coverage, pay your bill, file a claim all just from your phone. Some That's you already right. carry around with you. Who That's needs right, cardboard cards anymore? Jeez. No boy. A, a great <laughs> price with even greater service. So, Aubrey, as I always say, when you want the real deal. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You say that all the time, Tony. I do. This is AEW Unrestricted. Tony and Aubrey sitting here with Mr. Mayhem himself, Wardlow, talking a little bit about first matches, crazy experiences hard-hitting action uh, that we've experienced uh, watching you in Dynamite and working with you. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about your background. Uh, you actually trained in boxing and jujitsu. I have. Wow. How, how long and when did you start? Um, I actually started when I quit my job and pursued wrestling 100%. And I just figured anything I could do to better myself and better my in-ring shape and my authenticity. Mm. You know, I don't want to be just a guy that wrestles. Like, I want to know that, okay, people want to call what I do fake. Mm -hmm. Well, let's step outside of the ring. I will still whoop that ass. Yeah, what's up? Well, that, that so... Did you ever entertain doing something besides pro wrestling, like MMA or, or boxing or anything like that? No. I mean, okay. I, I grew up before UFC really blew up. Mm -hmm. So that growing up, that wasn't like really a, a thing. So it's always been wrestling. Um, now, there's been times during wrestling where I was like, oh, man, like this is what I'm getting into. Yeah. But we all know those stretch of awkward like 2010, 2011 when it was just there was only one option and it was not a good option. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I'm like, oh man, um, if I was younger, I would probably think about getting into MMA a little more. How old are you? I'm 32. Really? I would have assumed you were like 25. Yeah, I get that a lot. Yeah. But um, <laughs> fighting in an octagon is most definitely something I think about often. And maybe one day, I'll never say never. Yeah. But. You pull Lesnar, go win a title, come back. Yeah. It's it's very intriguing. Um, professional football is something I feel like I could have been very successful in. Um, but again, it's just I've never, I've just had tunnel vision on pro wrestling. There's never been any. As much as I like other things, I always knew this was it. It's awesome. Did you ever talk to Jake Hager about MMA? Um, Hager and I really don't speak much. They just look at each we other. We just kind of stare at each other. They, I think we have a little bit of a... They got giant heat. I don't even know why we hate each other, but we do. <laughs> okay. It's like that <laughs> alpha male thing. like Tremendous. I love it. So you're from great. Middlefield, Ohio, which is near Cleveland. Yes. So started your wrestling training there. You said you've been a wrestler your entire life. Like, what does that actually mean? When did you start? Where did you go? Um, so I remember my older sister was a wrestling fan. 
and she had like this little booklet and it had like eight by tens mm. of like Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior and and I just remember flipping through that like oh these guys are so cool looking and then I watched it for the first time and I have home video somewhere before I can even remember or talk I'm just a little baby with these huge big rubber action figures and I'm using the kitchen table chair as the ring ah. and I'm just clanging and banging them um, but my first uh, memories is Brett the Hitman Hart oh good one I don't know what it was about him but when I was a kid Brett the Hitman Hart just truly captured me and it was just his confidence and his believability um, and his selling and just he just sucked me in and I fell so in love with wrestling and Mr. Perfect as well was mm. another one. God, I was such a big Mr. Perfect fan. Um, and it was just like, I just never looked back. And then through the years you have these guys, you know, it goes from Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect to Kevin Nash was a big inspiration to The Rock, um, then Jeff Hardy, then guys like Brock Lesnar and Batista. And it's just over the years, I had all these guys that kind of morphed me into who I am today. And, um, but yeah, I just, I lo I've loved it forever. Damn. So where did you train? Oh boy. So I, the reason I got into wrestling so late was because I didn't know indie wrestling was a thing. Right. So I'm from the middle of nowhere, Ohio. I knew there was WWE, WCW. That's all I knew. I didn't know indie wrestling was a thing. I didn't know where to go to train. I had no clue how to even start. Um, and I remember I was at a live event in Cleveland and some guy was handing out flyers. And I grabbed one of these flyers and I was like, pro wrestling show, what is this in Cleveland? Right. And then I flipped it over and it was like the Dungeon Academy I was like, there's a training school in Cleveland I could go to. It's so funny to hear you say that because to me, like Cleveland's a big wrestling town. Yeah, I had no clue. Like there's so many like named wrestlers that come from Cleveland. I'm like, how did you not? But I think all of us, like if we don't know about indie wrestling, unless someone introduces it to us, it's a completely foreign concept. Yes. But then once you realize it's a thing, it's like, oh no, of course, like there's the minor leagues that build you up to the majors, right? Unfortunately, none of my friends liked wrestling. Mm. Like, I didn't know anybody that was into wrestling. Um, so I remember I called them the next day and left a voicemail. And they brought me out for like a little tryout. And this place was just a bad part of Cleveland. Mm. It was truly a dungeon. I mean, this tiny little building, no heat, no AC. Um, mm. It's this tiny little ring. Um but Lamont Williams was training and I was literally the only person there and he couldn't believe that I had never been in a ring before. Um, reason being there was the show tough enough growing up. And I remember that very first season of tough enough was the first time that you actually saw like them teaching how to give bumps and everything. So I remember as a kid, I brought this little mat out to the living room and I just mimicked everything I saw. Ooh. And I basically trained myself doing flips and like literally the proper way to take a bump and just everything. Fall back and then figure so out like, like forward roll. Absolutely. Rolls. So I already knew all this coming into it. Um, so the training went well. The place was on its way out of business. So I didn't train there for long. Um, and a guy, Matt Justice, um, who's pretty popular on the indies right now. Um, he kind of took me under his wing and he helped teach me some things. And then he introduced me to IWC in Pittsburgh where Britt um, yeah. came up. And that's where I really uh, started training full time and working full time was with them. We're talking with Wardlow and we're talking about his training and his. Uh, I want to go back to you mentioned uh, Jeff Hardy. Uh, you mentioned uh, Mr. Perfect, obviously Bret Hart. As you grow up and you become a wrestling fan, is there one match that you remember from any of these guys that you thought, oh, that's it, man. That's what I want to do. That's that 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 caught my attention. 
man, it's it's hard for me to say because growing up, I I kind of only had like three VHS tapes that I watched a million times over and over. Um, which there was two Royal Rumbles. I think it was like 92 and 93. And then um, Caesar's Palace WrestleMania. Was that nine? I think it was nine. WrestleMania nine. I don't know. Tony probably remembers. Um, He's an old fart. So it was kind of just watching those over and over. <laughs> um, but I th- but it was Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect. Mm. Was one match. I think that was what? SummerSlam? I mean, you're asking me. I didn't watch wrestling back in the day. Okay. But that was one, that, that was one of the matches funny. that really got me excited. But the Royal Rumble match itself, I think, was the most intriguing thing as a child. Any particular reason why? Just the chaos of it? Yeah, I think just the excitement of not knowing of who's coming next. The and counting seeing down. all these different characters coming out. And, I, man, I just remember Mr. Perfect would get thrown over the top rope. 4,000 times every Royal Rumble and you thought he was getting eliminated and you would get back in. <laughs> I just remember going, no, don't, you can't get eliminated, you can't get eliminated. And he would always make his way back in. And then feeling so upset when he would get eliminated. So you left Cleveland, went to Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. got some training there, IWC. Uh, when did, like, you've got some pretty impressive moves in your arsenal like the f10 being one of them and you've got that like corner knee strike now at what point did you start perfecting those moves um i don't want to sound like an asshole but oh, no. <laughs> like this comes so natural to me yeah like i don't really have to practice these things you're a giant motherfucker it makes sense that you can throw things like throw people around yeah it's just i don't know everything just comes so natural that like anytime i want to try a new move it's like it's just there damn well as Aubrey said you're a giant motherfucker yep okay <laughs> you've been compared to a lot of diverse people in wrestling like uh jason momoa roman reigns what do you think about those comparisons I'll take the Jason Momoa comparison all day long. That's why that female viewership's so high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of Jason Momoa as an actor and as a human being. Um, he's a great dude and a handsome right. man. So I'll take that comparison all day long. I think, yeah. I, I think I'm a little better looking than Roman Reigns, but... There you go. I'll say yeah. Yeah, we would agree. I'll say yeah. We're biased, but we would still agree. Very biased. <laughs> very, very biased. You said in an interview last year that AEW or WWE was the goal for 2019. Was WWE ever an option for you? I think so. Um, did you ever have a tryout? I know people know that I did have a tryout, and I smoked that tryout. I mean, I was literally the only dude there in a suit, speaking of suits. Really? That's like their gimmick, is it you have to show up in a suit. mind blowing. Dudes are there in shorts and t-shirts. Oh, no, 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 no. That's because they're not recruiting wrestlers. They're recruiting ex-NFL athletes right. or college wrestlers, people that have never watched wrestling, don't care about wrestling. Like, the, the comments these people were making made me sick to my stomach oh, that boy. they were there getting an opportunity. Oh, boy. Where my roommate, I? of course, my roommate <laughs> is like, Man, I've never even watched wrestling. I don't even like it. I'm just like, get out of my room. Oh, my God. Like, why are you here? And it was his second tryout. Oh, my God. So you're These people are getting multiple chances. Um, So I smoked that tryout. I'm like, I have this in the bag. And like so much so, I literally sold my motorcycle, sold my house, like literally got rid of everything because I'm like I'm going to put everything into moving into Florida we're going to go to Orlando we're going to do all this thing so when the email came in that I was not um, man I remember I actually had to pull over on the side of the road Oh, because I was like I just couldn't believe it um, and then I started training personally with Kurt Angle mm. um, when he was getting ready to make his comeback for his final couple matches and me and Kurt clicked in the ring really well. And him and I talked a lot and he expressed that he had had a, a conversation with a certain somebody there about bringing me in. And he told me, he's like, it's not a matter of if, 
It's a matter of when. You just kind of have to wait for that opportunity because they want to slot certain people in. Right. And well, sorry, we're we're at the uh, Daily's Place venue, and they're definitely setting up for dynamite tomorrow. So there's some there's some background noise. Anyway, yeah, it's like you may be the best person there and totally smoke the tryout, but if you're not what they're looking for in that moment, right? That's not your fault. That's right. that's just the opportunity's not there. But you're clearly ready for it, and you're right. just waiting for it, and it just needs to come along. Yes, and Lord knows. I am not the most patient person. No. <laughs> at all. Um, that's always been a battle. So when the opportunity came with AEW and I heard what the plans were and I heard the vision and the passion behind it, I knew I, I knew there was nothing for me to wait for. Right. You just got to show up, man. This is what it is. Yeah. And I'm very happy I didn't say no and wait and wait and wait god knows i could still be waiting at this point who knows um i'm most definitely where i'm supposed to be that's so wonderful uh one more question before we go to our break uh you're a you're into comic books right i am oh are you dc or a marvel guy okay i always start with saying i love both okay but dc (laughs) really absolutely dc Says the Welcome to my bat cave. Yeah, he's got yes. Superman and his Batman over there. So yeah, yeah. that's Superman why you guys are friends. That's why you guys it's, are friends. That's it, man. I love Superman Batman. That's actually my favorite book to read is the Superman Batman oh. joint. What do you books. think of the movie? Oh man, how Shit. much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> it's a podcast about Wardlow, not his thoughts on Batman and Superman. <laughs> I, I love. All right, go ahead. I, I was just going to say I love Man of Steel. I loved right. Batman vs Superman. There's mm-hmm. many things I wish they would have done differently, and then Justice League was just the worst. Oh, terrible! I'm ready for the Snyder cut. <laughs> mm. Love it. We're talking to Wardlow here on AEW Unrestricted. Coming up, we've got quite a few fan questions. I'm excited. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Tony are here with Wardlow. All of Wardlow. He's massive. I can't fit them all in the frame. But uh, we've got quite a few fan questions. I was telling him during the break, I posted this question on Twitter, like, hey, give us fan questions. And from what I noticed, it was the most amount of questions I've gotten very quickly. So I think that female demo that we've been talking about, I think that actually uh, plays out a little bit here. Anyway, my favorite part, trying to inter- trying to uh, pro- uh, pronounce Twitter names. This one's easy. Eric J. Garland on Twitter. Ward Lewis said he doesn't have friends. So how does that lone wolf mentality help on the ring? And has there been anyone at AEW besides Max behind the scenes who you've really learned a lot from? Oh, that's a good question. Um, It helps me in many ways. I mean, I have zero distractions when I'm home. Mm. When I get home, it's right back to dieting, training. There's no question of, do I go hang out with this person? Do I go to this party? Do I go to this club? No, I know exactly what I'm doing all day, every day. Got to eat chicken. You got to go to the gym. Yeah, lots of eating, lots of training, lots of recovering. Um, so it just it keeps me me. Um, as far as friends here, you know, there's a huge learning tree that I am blessed to stand under here. We all are. Um, I've already learned so much from QT and Cody. Um guys like Arn and Jerry Lynn and Billy Gunn um, and even guys like um, the uh, FTR mm. and Tolly and um, Spears have all given me great feedback. Spears is a really good one. I don't think people really take advantage of chatting with him as much as they should mm-hmm. because I know I've learned a lot from Spears Absolutely. just even from a wrestling psychology standpoint. Um so those guys always give me great feedback. I'm cool with a few people, but the one person I'm, I would consider myself like really tight with or boys with um, is 10. Yeah. Well, which I've heard I know stories. is a known thing here. You guys uh, go eat your barbecue, go to the club. What time? Pre-COVID, go to the club. We went once. <laughs> like you go once and now it's like legendary. Like, oh, they go to a club every week. <laughs> uh, this is from uh, the Jinx on Twitter. Who is the not-so-obvious dream match that Wardlow would like to have? <clears throat> now, uh, 
Jinx would like to qualify that. It can be anyone, man, woman, alive, dead, intergender tag, fictional character. Who's the one person you want to have a match with? Oh, Jesus. This is like asking your favorite song or favorite movie or oh. favorite match. There's no, Yeah, I know it's difficult. There, there's you. not just one. Um, I would say the top two would be Rock. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other would be Brock. Oh. Mm. Okay. Um, aside from that, I've kind of already had one of my dream matches being Cody. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I would... No, I'd not. I would like to. I need to do that again. Mm. I have two losses: Hangman and Cody, and I won't find peace until I avenge those. We got to right those wrongs. Um, I would really want to wrestle Kenny as well, Omega. Yeah. Sure. I mean, one of the best wrestlers in the world. Who wouldn't want to mm-hmm. wrestle him, right? Just his mind is crazy. Uh, Brett Klein on Twitter asks: I'd like to know if Wardlow wasn't paired with MJF. Uh, who would he like to or who would he want to see himself paired with he and MJF work so damn well together it's hard for me to picture him with anyone else yeah I'm not much of a team guy so you don't say (laughs) I would prefer to just be alone Mm, lone wolf very much so yeah, I just I just work better alone. Right. This is a good one from Maggie K. It goes all the way down to the bottom here, Aubrey. Oh, yeah. No, I saw this one. Why are your Instagram stories so goddamn scary? Are they? I, what, what do you post on your stories? I don't actually watch. My Instagram is very professional. Like, it's just, it's, I don't share It's like picture, personal. one word caption. Or yeah. no word captions. Yeah. It's it's always it's either wrestling or workout related. So I do I post a lot of gym selfies if that that's the terrifying thing. Which is very large and intimidating, I guess. I guess some people find that scary. I guess so. Oh. Well, you're just yourself, right? On Instagram. Yeah. No fluff, just who you are. Right. Just lone wolf. Because you're again, you just mentioned before, you don't have that many friends. You're a lone wolf. You you're you're very, you know, low key so to speak and yeah. that's the way those Instagram posts are so maybe it's scary to some people loneliness is scary for some people <laughs> I don't I I would not do well I embrace it I, listen you may be a loner but I don't think you're lonely no nah, this is true yeah okay I have my dog <laughs> hey what kind of dog <laughs> do you have he's a lab mastiff mix ooh what's his well, name of course he's just a big lab essentially yeah wow I uh, guess what his name is, Tony. He's uh, he's all white. It's I don't I don't know crypto. Uh, wait a minute. I don't know crypto. Yep, okay. that is freaking cool. And I'm going to show you a picture next time I see you. That's going to pop you okay. hard. You guys, are okay, fucking nerds. All right, we got a question from <laughs> Sid on Twitter. What match or feud before your appearance in AEW would you recommend uh, people watch to get more uh, idea of how you are and who you wrestle or how you wrestle? Um, before his fis- first vignette in the parking lot of AEW, I had never heard his name before. Very excited to see what's to come. Okay, a couple of my favorite matches on the indies. Um, there's a ladder match with RC Dupree um, that I love. Any match I've had with a guy named Bulk Nasty. Bulk Nasty? Bulk Nasty. And he looks just how you would think. He's a big dude. Big, strong dude. And like I said, I love wrestling that type of match. And him and I, when we clash, we clash. Um, And then the others, anything with John McChesney. um, Oh, Jesus. Bill Collier. Ah. John McChesney and Bill Collier in Revenge and IWC. Those are my favorites. Got a lot of indie wrestling to watch now. There you go. All right. uh, BJB says, that's BJB says on Twitter, what are a few things you've learned since joining AEW that have helped you most in or out of the ring? Hmm. Some tough ones here this week. Yeah. Oh, gosh. People are very interested in the intellectual side of Wardlow. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like being a part of this company, the biggest 
thing it's done for me is just remind me to stay true to myself and always be a professional. Mm-hmm. And like, just, there's often times where it's like, ah, should I go do this? And it's like, no. And it like, it just keeps me focused. It keeps me right and keeps me making good decisions. Yeah, smart. You're a big um, inspiration to a lot of people, I think, just with your work ethic and whatnot. Right. Jason Long on Twitter asks, who is the one person in AEW that you would both love to put through a table and have lunch with? And have lunch with? Yeah, there's like a Venn diagram of put through table and lunch. Man, <laughs> who wouldn't I like to put through a table is the better question. Yeah, I think so. I'd like to put like 98% of the roster through the table. <laughs> Um, Great answer. So which one of those would you want to have lunch with? (laughs) I think that's the better question. If I could get a group of like Tony, Jim Ross, Billy Gunn, um, Jerry Lynn, Dean Malenko, basically all the coaches and vets Mm. that I could learn from and hear great stories from. I would actually recommend this personal experience because we were hanging out with uh, Alex Abrahantes last night for his birthday. But I recommend if you ever have a chance, uh, play Cards Against Humanity with Jerry Lynn. He's a dirty motherfucker. <laughs> He's so funny. I could see it. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, no, no, this makes sense. The Jerry Lynn in my head now makes sense. But, you know, I understand what you're saying because I have discovered and I not really I've really, first of all, uh, feel honored you would put me in that group. But what I've discovered is that for you quote unquote youngsters and most of you are youngsters to me that you really enjoy the stories yeah. and um, just sitting down and telling the old, the old stories. And we have millions of them, uh, many, which cannot really be told uh, in public because it will get us all in trouble <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, or, on, or in jail, but you do enjoy the stories and, and you learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. I've already learned so much just from some of the stories I've heard. It's crazy how much you can get just sitting and listening. Mm -hmm. I find myself doing it a lot where you're just kind of listening to people talk about something and you're just like, this is fascinating. It's crazy. All right. uh, Let's hit uh, just a couple more. Uh, Benny the Mark. (laughs) Benny the Mark. Of course. Very, very explicit. Yeah. Uh, Who has a better physique? You or John Silver? Oh, wow. (laughs) Man, why you got to do my boy John? Like ah. <laughs> I think we have exact, equally good physiques. There we go. Team player, despite being the lone but if you, Great answer. But if you really want to know, just go on Instagram and you can see. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to say. Cool. I think I just posted like my first ever shirtless pic the other day. Ooh, female viewership's going way up now. <laughs> AJ Street on Twitter. If you could take one move from someone else and make it your own, who would you steal from and what would that move be? Man, haven't I stolen enough? That's all wrestling is, is just stealing things from other people. Uh, well, okay, so two things about that. The Swanton Bomb. Right. Which I do. And that's mostly because I've probably done literally hundreds of thousands on a trampoline. I mean, I would literally just do them over and over for hours every day like a sick person um beyond that maybe the rock bottom Ooh. um which i've been thinking of variations of that of how to make it my own that'd be cool um but speaking of the knee have you guys ever seen my corner strike knee done ever in your lives no i haven't because the first time you called that to me i was like Shit, that sounds devastating. Yeah, that choke the guy and then fucking. <laughs> that's my baby. I, I'm, I take a lot of pride in coming up with that on my own and being the first to ever do something quite like that. All right, well, we are talking to a cold blooded killer right here. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, good stuff, man. Very good. Uh, yeah, your work ethic, your attitude is is something I think uh, that I've, all young wrestlers had. Everybody would be a millionaire. <laughs> Just tremendous stuff, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think if people want to know how to be successful in this business, 
like you can watch all the grades, but I think watching an in progress story is definitely going to be you just because of all the positive things that you do to better yourself. Yeah. yeah. You're I mean, an inspiration friend. You got to put your everything into it. I mean, that's why I'm here is because I quit my job. I moved back in with my parents. I sold everything I had. I, stopped going on dates, stopped hanging out with people. I mean, I literally secluded myself and just head down full sprint into this. And yes. that's what you have to do when people talk about sacrifice. For me, it wasn't sacrifice. It was just the proper steps. Mm -hmm. But like when you hear people, you have to sacrifice for your dreams. You really do. Now we know after talking with you, why it's not so surprising you were so good in your cage match against Cody. Oh yeah. Uh, well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Good work, buddy. Okay. Uh, listen, you can follow uh, Wardlow on Instagram and Twitter at Real Wardlow. So make sure you follow him. And, and uh, even though Maggie says this, I don't think you're so goddamn scary on a, on Instagram. So <laughs> make sure you follow him. No, it's scary watching you eat. Yeah. <laughs> it was one time, I think we were in Chicago. I was telling the story before we were on the air. But like first time I've ever seen Wardlow order food. And it's just like three takeout containers. And they're all chicken. Just different kinds of chicken. And like, oh, yeah, no, he's going to eat all of that, of course. <laughs> Eating is my second favorite thing from wrestling and working out. I believe it. Wow. I believe it. Thanks for coming today, buddy. Thank you for having me, guys. Be sure to subscribe to the AEW Unrestricted Podcast for free. That's wherever you get your podcasts. And also check out the video of the podcast on YouTube. Just search AEW Unrestricted on YouTube. And don't forget, we have AEW Dynamite every Wednesday, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central on TNT. Wardlow, thanks again, buddy. It's always great talking to you. You are truly one of the big stars up and coming in our sport. Hell yeah. I'm Tony Schiavone, I'm, and she is... I'm Aubrey Edwards. Thanks for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Bye.